DiscerningHearts.com presents Villains of the Early Church and How They Made Us Better Christians with Mike Aquilina. Mike Aquilina is a popular author working in the area of church history, especially patristics, the study of the early church fathers. He is executive vice president and trustee of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology, a Roman Catholic research center based in Steubenville, Ohio. He is a contributing editor of Angelus Magazine and general editor of the Reclaiming Catholic History series from Ave Maria Press. He's the author or editor of more than 50 books, Villains of the Early Church, the book on which this series is based. He has hosted 11 television series on the Eternal Word Television Network and is a frequent guest commentator on Catholic Radio. Villains of the Early Church and How They Made Us Better Christians with Mike Aquilina. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Welcome back, Mike. Hey, thanks for having me back, Chris. Let's talk about a villain who, well, he was a politician, wasn't he? Or was he a high priest? It's hard to tell. (laughs) Well, it was a position, an important position of leadership in Roman Palestine at the time of our Lord in the first century. The position of high priest, well, there was only one. And whoever was placed in that role was supposed to hold the role for his entire life. So it was a position of honor. It was a position of influence. It was a position of power. And the Romans recognized all of that. And so the Romans watched the actions of the high priest very closely. Well, we're talking about Caiaphas. Yes. He, you know, I want to say he's kind of an enigma, you know, uh, only because he's supposed to be the religious leader, and yet what he seems to be doing as portrayed in the scriptures seems to be far from what we understand what religious leaders should be doing. Well, you know, it was a different world back then, Chris. You know, it's a, a, a you know, today we're we're accustomed to this idea of the separation of religion and government, the separation of church and state. But that was not the case in the ancient world anywhere. You know, usually it was the government that regulated religion. And in among the people of Israel, among the Jews at that time, their very government was seen to be a theocracy. It was a government with God as the king, with God as the supreme ruler. So you can't make that distinction in the ancient world. And so Caiaphas thought of himself very much as the ruler of the land in a certain sense, because the religion of the land really governed the lives of the people. Now, he was, am I correct in this? He was the son-in-law of Annas, who was the high priest who people still look to in some ways as the high priest. It gets a little confusing. It it does. It does. And you know, as I said before, the office of high priest was supposed to be held for life. It was like the papacy. Once you were in that office, you were in until you were dead. We hear that line, you are a priest forever uh, in the line of Melchizedek. Well, the, the high priest was supposed to be in there forever, as long as he shall live. And that was the custom. That was the tradition. And Annas was chosen as high priest. But, you know, he did not get along with the Romans very well. I don't know if it was his personality or the decisions he made, but the Romans did not feel like he was somebody they could work with. So they deposed him as high priest. Now, this is an affront. This is on the order of blasphemy for these Gentiles, these pagans coming in and meddling in the religion of Israel. You know, what business did they have doing that? Usually the Romans were a lot more sensitive in dealing with local religion. But there was no local religion like the religion of Israel because the the, the religion of the Jews demanded total commitment on the part of the people. Total commitment. Commitment with your entire life, and it governed your diet. It governed where you walked. It governed what you did on certain days of the week and certain days of the year. And no other religion on earth was like that in terms of demanding a total commitment. All of the other religions of that time had gods who could be worshipped, who who would accept sacrifice from people. But they were happy to share that place with other gods. You know, you could worship any of the gods of the Roman pantheon and then go on to worship an Egyptian god as well. 
the Romans might regulate the practice of religion, but they were pretty accommodating to local practices. The Jews presented a problem because they were monotheists. They did not permit the worship of other gods for their people. So this was a problem, and the Romans were very suspicious of it, and the Romans feared Jewish nationalism. They feared that there would be an uprising. So Annas must have seemed a threat to them, whether it was just his personality, as I said, or it was some tendencies in the way he thought or, or spoke to them. But they wanted him deposed, and so they had him deposed and replaced by his son-in-law, Caiaphas. So there were many people in Israel who still looked to Annas as the legitimate high priest, because you just don't stop being high priest unless your heart stops beating. So there were people who still looked to Annas uh, as having the real authority, and they saw Caiaphas as being a pretender in the whole scheme of things. Now, Caiaphas, we can bet, was a more accommodating person, easier to get along with, shrewder, a lot more able to deal with these foreigners and do business with them. Uh, that's why he was in that position. So Caiaphas was a deal maker. He was intent on keeping the peace in the land. And the way you did that was by talking Turkey with the Romans, by accommodating them to some degree, by negotiating certain ends, and by worrying about the things that might upset the Romans. Caiaphas saw Jesus as someone who had the potential to upset the Romans in a big way. In the beginning of our conversation on Caiaphas, I kind of referred to him as a politician, though technically he wasn't. He was the high mm -hmm. priest. But yet what he was doing, this is politics, isn't it? Well, yeah, it is. It is. And you, and you can see why. I don't think that his motivations were entirely bad. What he wanted was peace. And he had, uh, you know, that kind of modern way of saying, you know, you have to break some eggs to make the batter, to bake the cake. You know, you have to, to be tough in order to get the peace that you desire. And the peace really was what he wanted in his country. He didn't want the Romans to go nuclear, so to speak, on the situation in Jerusalem. He did not want them to curtail the activity of the temple or to take a more active role in Jewish affairs. And so you can't blame him for trying to negotiate with the Romans and doing it in the, the way he thought best. Unfortunately, you know, some of his ends were not so noble. You know, we see what happens when you desire peace even more than you desire God. It's not a real peace that you want then. It's a kind of a uh, uh, I don't know what, what to call it, a kind of uh, uh, placidity that's sterile, that's just an absence of any upset. We see in Jesus' life that he wasn't afraid to upset certain people, that he wasn't afraid of saying things that might offend them, and that often he brought about good ends by doing this. You know, we think of, for example, the cleansing of the temple, you know, where he showed real anger and he said things that would be certainly insulting to the money changers in the temple. But it was something that needed to be done, and it was an important and definitive moment for his ministry. We talked about this in the previous episode, that there is this mystery, because I have to believe that Caiaphas sincerely believed he was doing a good thing. Yeah, yeah, he did. He did. And again, this is what happens to us, any of us, when we try to make lesser goods into our ultimate good. And again, I'll go back to that scene of the cleansing of the temple where, you know, Jesus showed righteous anger as he went through and drove out the money changers. You really cannot imagine Caiaphas doing that. Mm -hmm. you, you just can't because this is the status quo. We've always had these money changers here as long as I can remember, as long as I've been alive. And a lot of people, well, their living depends upon uh, doing this, changing the money and making a little money on the side and selling the sacrificial victims and that sort of thing. So the temple w was set up as kind of a marketplace, which was not conducive to reverence, but he wasn't about to upset the established order. Jesus had no such qualms because his ultimate good was God himself and the bringing about of the kingdom of God. Yeah, I think that's the, the challenge for us today when we look at Caiaphas is that we can say 
we want peace, and so we make compromises. And even faced with something, and we don't even want to entertain the thought that maybe what I perceived or what I was holding so close, I could be wrong. That's right. And we all we all make compromises. We And it's good to make some compromises. For example, just everyday life, the people we're living with, we might have certain preferences in life. You know, I might prefer the stew to be salted a certain way. But if my wife prefers it another way, well, then I'm going to go with her way. And that's a compromise. That's an accommodation. It doesn't cost me anything. And it might even gain me something in the moral order, right? Mm -hmm. Just to make that little compromise. But we cannot compromise in the things of God. For God, we've always got to give more and never less. And for God, we, we have to say an absolute yes to his moral law. We cannot give away his things. We cannot allow his things to be used for lesser purposes. And we saw, we see that that's what was happening in the temple, that the priests were turning the temple into a den of thieves, as our Lord put it. They were turning it into a marketplace. And that was just wrong. Jesus saw that and he called it out. We've got to call out those situations when we see them. When we've got to deal with them. We've got to make sure that we don't take advantage of the gospel that way. This can be a big danger, especially for people who work in the apostolate professionally, like you and like me and uh, like many others out there. We'll return to the villains of the early church and how they made us better Christians with Mike Aquilina in just a moment. The St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology is a nonprofit research and educational institute that promotes life transforming scripture study in the Catholic tradition. Founded by Dr. Scott Hahn and with current Vice President Mike Aquilina, the center serves clergy and laity, students and scholars with research and study tools, from books and publications to multimedia and online programming. The St. Paul Center welcomes you to their free online studies. Whether you're studying scripture for the first time, Looking to take your studies to a higher level, or whether you're ready for advanced training, you've come to the right place. In addition, for each track of study, they recommend books that will enhance your study in prayer and build your library of essential works in biblical theology and spirituality. The studies are free. Just visit SalvationHistory.com to view a complete library. From a letter from St. Paul to the Ephesians, chapter 6. Be strengthened in the Lord in the might of his power. Put on the armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the powers, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness on high. Therefore, take up the armor of God so that you may be able to resist the evil every day and stand in all things perfect. Stand, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of justice and having your feet shod with the readiness of the gospel of peace, in all things taking up the shield of faith with which you may be able to quench all fiery darts of the most wicked one. And take for yourself the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit that is the Word of God. With all prayer and supplication, pray at all times in the Spirit, and be vigilant in all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Hello, my name is Deacon Omar Gutierrez, and I want to ask you to support Discerning Hearts in a special way. We, Chris McGregor, the board, and I all know that not everyone listening can help financially. We know we have listeners from all parts of the world, and we have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truths shared through Discerning Hearts totally free. So while you may not be able to contribute financially, what you can do is certainly pray, but also give us positive reviews on whatever platform you use to listen to us. If it's iTunes, Android, Stitcher, Spotify, however it is that you get these podcasts, or if you're on YouTube and you like our videos, please give us a good rating and write a review. The more good ratings and reviews we get, the higher our profile, and the more listeners will discover us, listeners who may have the means to contribute in the future. Please consider rating us and writing a positive review today. 
We now return to The Villains of the Early Church and How They Made Us Better Christians with Mike Aquilina. You know, it's amazing for all of his compromises, the temple would be destroyed. Yes, yes. And our Lord saw that coming. And so he tried to lead them to a certain detachment. When the apostles were marveling as, at the aesthetic beauty of the temple, our Lord told them that it would all be gone. You know, he tried to train our eyes on ultimate things so that we would not be tempted to compromise for the sake of any passing reality. You know, it's amazing that in some ways we all know Pontius Pilate because we at least say his name, and we're going to talk about him in the next episode, but we say his name in the creed because he's the one that killed Jesus, but he was really backed into a corner by Caiaphas, wasn't he? I mean, really, Caiaphas. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Caiaphas was a master manipulator. He really was, you know, what we consider today to be a a master of negotiation. He knew which buttons to press for Pilate. Now, I think that he really believed that Jesus threatened the social order. And that's why he emphasized these things to Pilate, because he wanted to bring about the execution of Jesus. He wanted to short circuit this process that he saw as potentially disastrous for the Jewish people and for the temple. He emphasized those things in dealing with Pilate. He pushed the right buttons, and he really did really force Pilate's hand in the condemnation of Jesus. I don't want to minimize Pilate's responsibility. I don't want to excuse his cowardice. It was, as the Gospels are, are you know, very plainly show us, it was a kind of collusion between God's chosen people, and these Gentiles. So it's as if all the world was in on the conspiracy against Jesus. And that's what we have to believe. It was not this people or that people who killed Jesus. It was all of us. And we all did it through our sins, exemplified by the sins of these villains in the story. But they're sins we can all identify in one way or another in our own sins, the sins that we confess when we when we go to the sacrament of penance. Wow, you know, you bring up a, a, a kind of an extraordinary point here, Mike, that in this action that Caiaphas took, that this was his sin. He chose this. Yes. And yet for centuries, the Jewish people would be held accountable in the eyes of many as the ones who did this at this deed. And we've got to be very clear about that. The Jews did not kill Jesus. We all killed Jesus by our sins. You know, even though I live 2,000 years after Jesus walked the earth during his, his public ministry, it was my sins that killed him. You know, uh, uh, St. Gregory the Great said, just as there's a communion of saints, just as there's a communion of holiness, just as there's a communion of all holy things, There is a communion of wickedness. There is a certain uh, collaboration in sin by all sinners. And all of our sins contributed to that need for a Savior. All of our sins contributed to the helplessness of humanity. All of our sins weakened the people of God and continue to weaken the people of God. This is why we have to hate sin, even venial sin, and try to put it out of our lives through the frequent practice of confession and frequent reception of Holy Communion. It's grace that's going to drive sin out of our lives. You know, so interesting. There's this trial, this examination of Jesus before the Sanhedrin, and yet could they examine themselves? Yes, and that is what Jesus always tried to get us to do, especially anyone who's in a position of judging others. And the Sanhedrin had that position. And this is true in the lives of parents and grandparents. Anyone who has even a modicum of authority in this world, we are judges. And we have to be very careful how we exercise that judgment. And we can see that they thought that certain sacrifices um, were worth making for what they considered a greater good. So Caiaphas himself said that it was better that one man die. He was willing to sacrifice this innocent man for the peace of the country. We all know that that wasn't true, but it turned out to be prophetic 
because that one man's death did save all the people, did save all the people who ever lived, really, through the application of the grace of the cross. The lives that we're looking at, these are tough to look at. I mean, it, yes. it's, it's tough to look at them. What is it inside of us, Mike, that it's easier to make them cartoons? Yes. And within each of us is, is that rebel. And we have to identify it and find out how it manifests itself because it's very for easy for us to think about our virtues. And it's very easy for us to think about our strengths and the good things we've done. It's hard for us to think about our sins and the pattern of sin in our lives. And it's very hard for us to think about the people we've hurt or the people we might have hurt. You know, we, we find that unpleasant, but really we're at our best when we make a habit of that, when we make a habit of self-examination, when we end all of our days by examining our conscience and then repenting of our sins and making a firm purpose of amendment for the next day. If we do that, God will give us the grace, especially through the sacraments, will give us the grace to change and to grow stronger in his, his grace you know, throughout our lives. I say this in all reverence to anyone that's living living out there to the the reality of where they're at. You know, this is where they're at, and I have to speak about myself as well. That I mean, Caiaphas is one of those characters that you know, I think we've been alluding to that we can become him. Oh yeah, and especially when it comes to matters of faith, especially when there's a lot of struggle and there is. Uh, challenges and hurts and different types of things, we have to be really careful that we don't speak in a, with Caiaphas's voice. Yeah, I, I mean, he's someone, obviously, who had succeeded. He had succeeded materially, and he had the appearances of succeeding spiritually. He held the highest religious office on earth, according to what the Jews believed. And so, you know, He's looking at his life and he's saying, hey, I'm on top of the world here. You know, never stopping to think that maybe I am concerned about things that are less than ultimate. Maybe I'm concerned about worldly things in opposition to heavenly things. As we're kind of closing the door here on Caiaphas, and there's so much more about him in your book, Mike, Villains of the Early Church and How They Make Made Us Better Christians. But just in closing the door on uh, this particular quote unquote villain, any final thoughts? <laughs> well, I think it's interesting that, again, Christians have this desire to see people saved and to believe that anyone is savable, mm -hmm. that there's hope for everybody. And so we find legends, and I talk about these legends in the book, these legends of Caiaphas receiving the gospel eventually and becoming a disciple and of becoming an evangelist even, of going out to the world and telling the good news about Jesus. Unfortunately, we have no early witnesses to that, those legends, only uh, medieval witnesses to those legends in Syria. But you can see something, some value even in those legends. It's not historical value. They might not witness to anything that actually happened, but they witness to the desire of Christians to save sinners, even the worst of sinners in every age. Oh, I think that's the d desire of the Father. Yes, that, that we all may be one and united yes. with with Him. I mean that that's in the Scriptures. That's not a happy thought. That that's a directive from the Scriptures themselves. Yes, yes, yes. So we join our hope with those Christians, those medieval Christians who wanted even Caiaphas to be saved. Mm. Thank you so much, Mike. Thanks for having me, Chris. You've been listening to Villains of the Early Church and How They Made Us Better Christians with Mike Aquilina. To hear and or to download this episode, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts in cooperation with the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission and if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, 
We hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for The Villains of the Early Church and How They Made Us Better Christians with Mike Aquilina.